in 3 John here. I know we started in this this morning and there was some meat left on the bone and I thought we'd have it for dinner tonight as well. Uh, this is a different topic though. There's four different people mentioned in this book. It starts out by the elder John and then he goes on and talks about Gaius the well-beloved. We talked about Gaius this morning. But then there's two other characters that are mentioned in the second half of this chapter. As you take the Word of God with me, look at verse number 9. It says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. So here's this other person involved, Diotrephes, and he is juxtaposed, if you will, to verse number 12. It says, Demetrius hath good report of all men. So there's two other people left in this chapter, and I want to title this sermon, if I could, Diotrephes versus Demetrius, and there seems to be a church fight. Now this sermon has nothing to do with anything that's going on in our church, and I do thank God for the unity that he's given us in our church. This is a warning of a false prophet trying to come to the top and uh, bubble up to the surface, if you will, and use a position of authority to begin to push other believers out of the church and cause contention and strife. This Diotrephes is characterized as an angry person, a hateful, hurtful person. We would probably give them a title today as being a narcissist. You know what I'm talking about when I use that word? A narcissist, a psychopath, somebody that says, I'm better than everybody else, and I love myself, and I don't care about everybody else. So they come to serve me. This word preeminence, if you notice in verse 9, he says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence. This word preeminence, we would call that a superiority complex. Now, Jesus taught us to serve people, right? Uh, doesn't he say, by love, serve one another, right? Uh, we're, we're here to serve people, but not this guy. He had a different opinion. He said, I'm up here, and I'm better, and I am superior. That's what the word means. Uh, maybe a synonym for the word would be um, prominence, thinking that they're better somehow. Or predominance, I should dominate you because I'm better and I'm special, when it says that he has the preeminence, I believe it's borderline blasphemous because only God deserves the preeminence. Only he deserves to be put above everybody else. And when he came down to the earth, he came in the form of a servant. He washed the feet of the man that would betray him and have him put to death the night of that. So he came serving and loving and giving us this wonderful example. But here, Diotrephes, he thought he was better than everybody else. This is usually one of the biggest red flags of a false prophet or somebody coming into a church to cause division and separation and problems. They usually think that they're better and they let you know it too. They don't hide the fact that they think that they're better. They treat you that way. Notice it says, who loveth to have the preeminence among them that's in the, among them and he says, receiveth us not. Now this is written by John, and he's referring to himself and others. When other apostles would try to come to the church, this uh, Diotrephes would reject them. Hey, who are you? You're, you're, no, no, we're not interested in you coming here. We've got it all figured out. We don't need your help. Now, back then an apostle it was like an evangelist, what we would call today a traveling evangelist that would go around and help churches and encourage them or maybe even set things in order. Uh, a lot of them had different responsibilities back then as churches were being formed in cities where Christ had not been named and new churches were being found and formed and needed some uh, help in getting things in order. Well, this guy thought that he saw the, I guess, the power or the money, the position, whatever it is, and he said, well, I'm smarter than everybody else. I can learn this stuff and I'll just teach it and they can all follow me and serve me. I'll tell you, listen, Jesus is better than all, isn't he? Amen. He's better than us all. He's better than every human, uh, human being. In fact, he created all humans. And when he came to the earth, he pretty much served all, but he still also did rebuke the false prophets. He rebuked the Pharisees and he warned his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He said the doctrine of the Pharisees, they say one thing and they do another. And the most important part of that is it's in the gospel. 
They say that you have to keep the law to go to heaven. And they don't even believe in God or in heaven. They were hypocrites in their heart. And Jesus was very angry with them. Notice that, that first thing at the end of verse 9. It says, they receiveth us not. So they weren't letting people into the church because they were too proud. Verse 10, wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Right? So he's playing these games and he's using very hurtful, harmful words. Uh, to be malicious is to, with an intent of hurting something or corrupting or causing problems. He was a hurtful, hateful, angry person. It says, and not content therewith. He wasn't satisfied. He wanted more. He wanted to take over everything. Uh, and then it says, notice it says, neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. So first of all, he's not receiving people. Then when other people, hey, there's this guy, we're going to bring him in. He's a Christian too. And they're like, no, no, I don't want that guy in our church. You keep him out. And he would threaten the people that were in the church that they should be kicked out of the church if they're trying to bring other certain disciples or apostles or evangelists into the church. Causing a bunch of confusion, causing strife and problems in this church as the organizational structure uh, was at risk here as this man was trying to cause uh, division and strife. So he wanted to, uh, it said he receiveth them not, and then it says he forbiddeth them, and then it says in verse 10 he casteth them out. Of the church. Look at verse 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. I want to focus on this verse for a second because I think it's super important. It's very relative. If you notice in this verse, the second half of it, it seems to say if you're saved, you'll do good works. And if you're not saved, you'll, you won't do good works. That's what it seems to say, but that's not what it says. <clears throat> Naomi, would you get me a water, please? This verse is teaching to reject the evil leader and receive the good leader. I've had somebody use this verse and try to show and tell me that if you're saved, you're really going to do all the good works and you'll just automatically become a good person. But that's not what the Bible says. It warns us that this old flesh is still here. So when he says, he says, he that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. He's not making a blanket statement that every person that does good, it's because they're saved. And if you're saved, you will do good. That's not what he's saying. This is in the middle of a division problem between other people. And he says, this guy receives us not. He's working against us. Malicious words forbids us not. Cast us out. And then he says, follow not that which is evil. Evil means harm. Malicious means harmful. So this was a hateful leader. And he was trying to push people out of the church. And he's trying to say, don't follow this guy. Don't follow the guy that's being hurtful and harmful. Instead, follow the good guy. We say, well, where does he say the good guy? Well, the very next verse, if you look at it. Demetrius hath good report. So when he says, follow the good, he's saying, follow the guy that's doing things right. Don't follow the guy that's causing all the contention and strife and problems and he's kicking people out. You focus on the one that's doing it the right way with the right intention. He says, Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He hath, the Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? He hath a good report of all men and of the truth itself, yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. So here John is saying, and I'm vouching for that guy. Ignore this Diotrephes who wants the preeminence and is kicking people out. Focus on Demetrius, who is probably a humble servant who loves the Lord and loves the truth. Uh, he's trying to tell them who to pay attention and even, really, if you will, who to listen to. Uh, if you would, I, I want to share a few verses with you on this concept because uh, we're going to come back to this in a moment. But uh, church divisions were nothing new in the New Testament. 
Uh, if, even, in fact, they happen in the Old Testament as well. Uh, if you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want to show something similar but different where there was a problem in leadership and people were confused as who to lead or who to follow rather. And, and God kind of gave them some insight. Now that man, Diotrephes, he was a proud person. He thought he was better, but he was hurtful and hateful and contentious, causing strife. And, you know, we're not supposed to be around angry people. I mean, doesn't it say, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You should not let anger take control of you. And if you get angry at somebody, you shouldn't let it pour into tomorrow. If you do, it goes on, it says you're giving place unto the devil. If you want to get angry with somebody and stay angry, you might as well open up the door to the devil and say, well, come on in, devil, and do whatever you want, because I'm good and mad, and I don't care if I hate them right now, and I'm angry, and I just think, I want my pound of flesh, right, or my ounce of blood, or whatever it is. You get so mad that you're seeing red, and you're no longer walking in the Spirit. Now you're no longer filled with God's Holy Spirit and you're walking in the flesh. Church strife and contention is no thing, no new thing. In fact, uh, it's probably happened in every church I've ever been in. <laughs> you know, from the time I've grown up and, you know, I thank God that he's delivered us of problems in the past in church with contention and strife. And uh, boy, God is good and merciful and he gives us an example that we should not allow anger and pride to rule the church. That's not his will. In fact, he tells us in Proverbs 22, he says, make no friendship with an angry man. Why? Lest you learn his ways. You want to hang out with an angry guy? Then you'll become an angry guy. You want to let him in your head? It'll get down in your heart and it'll come out of your mouth and you'll say the stuff that he says and the way that he says it and you'll lose your care and your love for others. This is very important. In fact, you think of Saul, King Saul in the Old Testament. A man that was filled with God's Holy Spirit. And so much so that when he prophesied, they said, Saul is among the prophets. And then later he was so angry at David that he's throwing a javelin at him. It says that he prophesied of an evil spirit in his house. I really believe that every Christian has that ability. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You get good and mad. You let the devil take place in your heart. You can... Preach, prophesy, teach things out of hatred towards somebody else. You can let the devil have that much room in your heart. Very dangerous warning. Saul prophesied of an evil spirit in his house. Here in 1 Corinthians, there was a little bit of division problem in this early church. If you would look at verse number 10. 1 Corinthians 1, verse number 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, generally speaking, as a church, we take stands on certain doctrines, and when it comes to the gospel, we all need to be on the same page. When it comes to the Word of God, we all need to be on the same page. There are some other doctrines that I think the Lord allows us to be a little bit different, and we can be in fellowship, and it's not a contentious problem. The Lord's Supper is something that there's a doctrine for. Praying for one another, there's a doctrine for that. We should teach that and keep that. Baptism after salvation, we should all be in unity on that. You shouldn't come to me and say, I, I want to get saved. Will you put me under the water? I'd say, no, 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 no. We don't do it that way around here. We're in unity on this doctrine. That's what we all believe. And if you don't understand it, and you don't have to just ask me. Ask the man sitting next to you in the pew because would to God all the Lord's people were prophets. We should understand it's believer's baptism. There are certain things that are super essential and important. I, I understand there's those that have a different opinion on the timing of the rapture or the resurrection. Well, you know what? That's okay. This doesn't have to be a point of contention and strife. There are some things, you know, the Bible talks about a man should have short hair. Well, how short are you talking? <laughs> well, I don't know. It doesn't tell me. 
If it said three inches, we'd do three inches. You know, I've heard people, I mean, some people take it to the extent of you shouldn't have a long beard either. And it's like, well, wait a minute, everybody in the Bible had a beard. Now you're getting a little weird, right? I mean, there are certain things the Lord gives us some liberty on, but generally speaking, He wants us all to be on the same page and teach the same doctrine and believe the same things because we have the same source, right? And so when it comes to salvation, we have that foundation, which is Christ. We understand the Godhead. We know what He did. We know salvation's by faith. And so those things we've nailed down and we're not going to let anybody mess that up. Not anybody. I don't care what they bring to the church to benefit us. We should never compromise on the doctrine of salvation. Never, never, never. Yeah, but you don't understand. They're a heavy tither. I don't care. I'd, I'd rather you not tithe and go away. They come in here and cause strife and contention over what the gospel is and uh, whether or not you have to work to go to heaven or not. We're on the same page and we preach the same doctrine and we want to be in unity. Why? Because so we can help each other. I understand some people may come in and say, yeah, but what about this verse? I don't understand. And that's one thing, but it's another when somebody says, well, let me get up in that pulpit and I'll show you how you have to work your way to heaven. I say, listen, buddy, you can take a walk, right? We should be on the same page. Look at verse 11. He goes on in 1 Corinthians. He says... For it hath been declared unto me and of you, by my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. That's the real super spiritual one. Well, I follow what Paul teaches. I follow Apollos. Well, I just follow Christ, you know. You've seen people like that. Here's my favorite one. Well, brother, you can believe it your way, and I'll believe it God's way. As if to say, if it wasn't <laughs> what he believed, then it's not of God, you know. And, you know, that's the preeminence. That's the heady, high-minded uh, knowledge that people get puffed up about. Uh, so he says that people were divided inside of this church. Now, if you go on in the story, you would understand that Paul was an apostle. He was not a pastor. That wasn't the calling he had on his life. And God used him to help this church get started. And then he left. And he wanted to leave Apollos, it seems from what we read in the chapters, that he wanted to leave Apollos in charge as the leader. But some people said, I don't like what this Apollos is doing. I want to go back to what Paul said. And it's like, well, Paul and Apollos really preached the same thing. So why are you causing strife and contention? Notice he says in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now Paul's really kind of getting at them. He's getting under their skin. What, did I die for you? I don't think so. Was, was I crucified for you? I don't think so. So if you think you're going to follow me instead of the pastor that's in charge of the church, you got a problem, buddy. You need to follow the order that's in there and not try to put me higher than you ought to. And just, we're all, we all follow the Lord. But, you know, uh, Paul said it elsewhere. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And in the simplest form, that's my instructions here to the church. Follow me when I'm doing the, what I'm supposed to do according to the Bible. But if I fail, God forbid if I fail as a man and I do something that goes against the Bible, don't follow me in that. You follow the Bible. You follow Christ. And so Paul was make, even making that point. You only follow me when I'm doing what's right because even Paul had sins. He was still a sinner. Look at verse 17. It says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. People are confused about the gospel. They think that you have to be saved and baptized to go to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. Here he says, I, I was not sent to baptize you. I was sent to get you saved. Now, the Great Commission certainly includes those instructions that after they get saved, then they should get baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Acts 8 makes it real clear. After you get saved and you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then you should get baptized. But Paul's making this big deal like, listen, my gifts are evangelism and preaching the gospel and getting people saved. And Christ sent me to do that number one 
And baptism takes a back seat to everything else. So let's not get baptism confused because that's what we're happening. Some people are saying, well, the, the Jewish customs matter. Or no, baptism is part of salvation. And so he's trying to straighten things out from outside of town with this letter. And he makes it real clear. Uh, he even says in verse uh, 15 and 16 that, you know, I, I baptized. Uh, he says, lest I should say that I have baptized in my own name. He said, I'm not even boasting. I didn't want to baptize people. I didn't come to baptize people. I'm more worried about getting them saved. And that ought to be the goal of every church is to get them saved first. And then, well, yeah, we're Baptists, so we want to get them baptized too once we know that they're saved. That also is the goal. Go to chapter 3 real quick. I didn't want to spend a lot of time in 1 Corinthians, but this was an issue that you see. If you're reading through your daily reading, when you get to Corinthians, you'll see what I'm talking about with this, that it seems they begin to have these contentions and problems and strife and confusion. And Paul's trying to set it all in order. And he's going to say, uh, just follow the leader and you'll be okay. Don't say, don't say you're following me when I'm not there. And, you know, don't subvert the authority structure that God has. Most false prophets tried to do that. Like this Diotrephes, he was such an angry man and he hated the people in the church that he was using them and devouring them and manipulating them because he wanted power, control, and money. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, look at verse number 3. For ye are yet carnal. That means you're baby Christians. You're still fleshly. He says, ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Guys, you know, we're not supposed to call ourselves by another man's name. We're called by the name of Christ. Even in the Old Testament, they were called by God's name Israel. If my people, which are called by my name. And the name was Israel. That was a representation. And hey, we're the same way. We're supposed to be called by the name of Jesus Christ. That's what we're identified as, as Jesus Christ. Like we're supposed to be following Christ, disciples of Christ, Christians. Look, he says, you're still carnal. Verse 4, look at Verse number five, he says, Who is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? That's a really good verse to teach that <coughs> people need people to get saved. I'm not saying I'm taking any credit for somebody else's salvation, but I am saying we've been commanded to preach the gospel. And he says here that we have ministers, that's servants, that help us get saved. He says, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. Look at verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. So again, he's going back to, I can't take credit for anything. God deserves all the glory. Even in my own salvation, the person that preached the gospel to me, it's not about them. It's about the gospel. It's about Jesus. Now, we as people are called to do that and to fill that void. And when we go out and we talk to others about Jesus, we're either planting a seed for the first time in the soil when we give them the seed, which is the Word of God, or we begin to water a seed that's already there, and that, water may, that seed may begin to spring forth and increase as God works in their heart as we give them the Word of God. Look at the next chapter. Look at 1 Corinthians 4. Look at verse number 1. He says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Now, we're, we're here because I'm just trying to show you an example of, listen, your leaders in the church should be found faithful. And I thank God that we don't have a, a strife problem, a contention problem, a leadership problem. Um, I'm thankful for what the Lord has given us in unity. And so this isn't really a sermon about us in a sense, but it's like a maintenance sermon. Like, um, and I know we have some visitors with us tonight. When maybe in your church you're dealing with something where one guy wants to do it one way and another guy wants to do it another way. And listen, we need to do it God's way. We need to do it the Bible way. And we need to follow the humble people, not those that are puffed up and proud and desiring the preeminence, trying to accomplish something great for themselves. He says in verse 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. This is the characteristic we look for. Verse 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. 
Yet I am not hereby justified, but he that judgeth me is the Lord. So they even started judging Paul. Well, Paul did this, and he's like, listen, you can take it up with the Lord. Verse 5, therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Verse 6, and these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollo. So he's saying, listen, listen to this man. He has an authority in the church for your sakes that ye might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you should be puffed up one for one against another. So we shouldn't have our favorites, and I, I wish that guy would take that guy, you know, because it's almost like they're wanting this fight in the church. Verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? I love this statement. Uh, you know why you're different than me? Because God made you different. Do you know why you have different talents than I do? Because that's what God has given you. God wants you to be different. God has a different mission for you. He has a different purpose for you. And he's given you everything you need to fulfill your course. The question is, will you do it? He says, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? It's like two kids bragging, one saying, my bike's better than yours. And it's like, well, you didn't buy it, your daddy bought it. <laughs> you know, like, that doesn't make you special because it's not like you earned it or built it. Your daddy bought it for you. I mean, that's what it is. God gave you some gifts, didn't he? Uh, if you would, go to 1 John. Go back near the end there. We're at 3 John. We're going to go back to that in a second. But go to 1 John. I want to share this with you because this Diotrephes hated the brethren. He rejected them. He didn't receive them. He cast them out. He was malicious toward them. Anybody that supported them, he hated them and kicked them out. And he all along was the false prophet. He was the one that was the problem. He was the one that needed to be kicked out and removed, needed some order in that church, and he was butting heads with the leadership that was there. In 1 John, if you will, go to uh, verse, chapter number 2, 1 John 2. And when you get there, find verse number 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in the darkness even until now. now. This is a big indicator of the Christian love that we should have for one another. When Christians love hating on other Christians. Look, I understand there are people slightly different from us in a different camp of a different stripe. But if their gospel is right, we can minister to them. Now look, if their gospel is wrong and they're like the JWs and the Mormons and they preach you have to turn from all your sin to be saved and you might make it and, they, and they're preaching a false gospel, they need to get that right before we can call them a brother. But inside the church, we need to have love one for another and it shouldn't be a place where we're always looking, hey, did you see what so-and-so wore today? Oh, do you see, they didn't come, but I'm here. Oh, look at me, I'm better than that. That's wanting the preeminence. And the problem is we have that nature in our natural man, in our flesh. We desire to feel good about ourselves because we're doing better than our neighbor. Instead, we need to love somebody. And I often tell somebody, if you see their problem, maybe God's revealing it to you so that you can pray for them and help them grow. Instead of criticizing them and tearing them down and gossiping about them and wishing harm on them. If you can notice it, well then good. Pray for it. Put it at the top of your prayer list. I had somebody reach out this past week where they have some strife going on. And they asked me a question. They said, what do you do when somebody's going around the church spreading gossip about your family, your wife, and your children? What do you do about that? I thought, oh my, this is a big issue. And they're not in this church and... I don't know their whole situation. And I said, well, first of all, you pray about it. Then you pray for them. And then you go to them personally. And as I was sending the text to him, replying back, he sent me another text saying, it's the pastor's wife. I thought, oh, my. Isn't it horrible when, when leadership hurts people? 
Isn't it horrible? Because, you know, in leadership, you're here as the shepherd to help. And when you hurt the sheep, it's a horrible thing. We're here to represent Christ. I wish I could say that I've never hurt anybody's feelings in all of my time as a, as a leader. I, I wish I could say that, but I'm a human being as well. But God forbid that we should build a ministry on hurting people and desiring the preeminence and trying to elevate ourselves above somebody else and preferring one person over another person. These are things that as human beings we have to learn to grow past and we have to learn to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially when they look different than us and sound different and smell different, whatever it is. We're going to spend eternity together. We should learn to love each other now. This is a big indicator of somebody... It's moving in the wrong direction. Look at verse 10. You're in 1 John 1. I'm sorry, 2. 1 John 2. <coughs> verse 10. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light. Picture your choice. Hey, I want to walk in the light with Christ. I want, to, I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, well then love your brother. If you can't love your brother, instead you're trying to tear them down and point out all their shortcomings and hurt them and hate them, well, you're being like the bad guys, and you don't want to do that. He says, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness hath blinded his eyes. This is the warning to Bible-believing Christians that are already saved. Don't go back to the dark side, if you will. Don't go back into the darkness because you're going to stumble and hurt yourself. You're liable to hurt somebody else. I mean, seriously, if you hear something in the middle of the night, I mean, what do you do? Get the bat and start swinging in the kitchen and hope that none of your family's in there? No, God forbid, you know. I heard something in the bathroom, so I started shooting. And it's like, oh, hey, where's my wife? Uh-oh. <laughs> that wouldn't be any good. No, you don't want to hurt somebody in the darkness. And that's kind of what, what's happening here is we're, we're attacking in the dark, whereas we should walk in the light. best thing you can do is pray. Well, there's something out there that scares me. It's in the dark. What should I do, Lord? When you have a brother or sister in Christ, we ought to be praying and loving them instead of hating them. Go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse number 11. 1 John 3, verse 11. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So this is not new. This is that same old message. Verse 2, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. You know what happens is our sin and our pride and our shortcoming, it causes us to despise those that are doing right. That's human nature, whether you're saved or not. That's just how it works. Oh, there's some new person at work, and boy, they're really the hot shot. They're showing everybody up. I just can't stand them. I wish he'd get theirs. Why? Hey, man, they're helping the whole team. Oh, man, they're doing all the hard stuff. That makes it easier for us. No, 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 we, we'd rather see them fall and crash and burn and get hurt. And You know, I mean, seriously, that's human nature that we have to fight against. And we can with the Holy Spirit. Where were we? He says in chapter 3, verse 11. No, he says in, yeah, because his brothers were, verse 13, look at this. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Now, it's one thing. We know the world is going to hate us, but it shouldn't be from in the church. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Now, that's a strong statement. And again, this is not a litmus test. If you've ever hated somebody so bad you wish they were dead, that doesn't mean you're not saved. What it's trying to highlight is that's the old man, this old flesh that's not going to leave this earth. It's rotten, it's corrupt, it's carnal, but it's the new man that helps you have a supernatural love to grow up into Christ and begin to love others even when they're unlovable. He tells us in Jude, if some have compassion, making a difference. There are a lot of people in this world, they just need somebody to come by and make a difference in their life with compassion. 
And boy, we can, we can cross our arms and stick out our lip and our chin and get all mad about the world and how wicked and weird it's gotten. But when you get that way that you've failed to love somebody uh, and have compassion on those that need help, then you've not succeeded. And listen, as Christians, we get the victory through Jesus Christ. And sometimes by loving the unlovable is that opportunity. It's like the chink in the armor. You could come up and be mean to them and it'd bounce right off of them and you wouldn't get to them. But if you loved them and you told them why, it's because of Jesus. That would go deep into their heart and stay with them and open their mind. It is unnatural. It is supernatural. It's spiritual love. We need his help and he gives us the power. Look, he says in... Verse 16, hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. How can we see what God's love looks like? Well, he laid down his life for us, okay? And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. How many times do we stop being selfish and we go out of our way to help somebody that's in need? How many times do we go out of our way to serve somebody else, even when we're cold and tired and hungry and wore out and I've got a headache, it's been a long day, i got the sniffles, I'm not sure I should even go over there and help them or not. Oh man, you're, I'm going to get dirty. I mean, we, we can find excuses, can't we? You know, sometimes just coming to church is, I believe, a work that God is well pleased with because you came to hear the Word of God. You came to encourage your brother or sister in Christ. Hey, you know what I'm going to do today? I'm going to come because I know old so, sister so-and-so. She'll be encouraged to see me, and I'll tell her I love her, and it's good to see her. God looks down, and he rewards you with joy. He says in verse 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? When you see your brother has a great big need, and you can solve it, you can fix it, it's no skin off your back. Hey, whatever you have, God gave it to you. Maybe sharing it with a brother or sister in Christ would give God the glory. And you say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't know. They might, they might bring it back. It might be chipped or dinged up or something. It might not look as nice as when I gave it to them. Who cares? God gave it to you. Verse 18, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed, and in truth. You know what that means? Don't just tell me you love me. Show me you love me. One of the greatest things in the marriage relationship is not to tell your spouse that you love them, but it's when they feel that you do love them. That's success. That's true love. That's the way it ought to be. And that's the way it is with God because, you know, God doesn't have to knock on my door every day and say, hey, Adam, I love you. I still do. I, I know you're rotten and I know you're human and I know you're fleshly, but I still love you. He doesn't have to do that. He has already, but even those times when I'm down and discouraged and worried and troubled and trying to figure something out, you know, the Holy Spirit's right there with me and He wants to lift me up and He wants to encourage me and He reminds me how much He loves me. And when He does that to me, I need to just turn around and say, man, that's good. I need to do that to somebody else. Maybe there's somebody on my phone I haven't talked to in a while. Let me send them an encouraging text message. Let me send them a good verse. Let me just tell them I'm thinking about them and praying for them. If we'll get in that habit, I believe... God will bless us in kind, but even greater. Go to chapter 4, if you would. 1 John chapter 4. And look at verse number 19. 1 John 4, verse 19. It says, we love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. This is a great and powerful thing because, again, in this world we have uh, some people are poorer than others and some people are more famous than others and some people are smarter than others and we have all these levels of greatness and whenever you find yourself greater than somebody else, we kind of want to stay up here and stay away from them over there. But that's not what God's will is. He's greater than all, and he, is, he, he came very lowly and meek and loving. 
And we ought to do the same thing, especially to brothers and sisters in the church. And how can I say, I really love God, but boy, that guy over there, he just gets on my nerves. I don't know what it is. Well, why don't you pray for him? Why don't you love on him? I, I, you know, I don't know why, man. You don't deserve it, but I love you. <laughs> It'd be better than nothing, right? <laughs> Go back to 3 John, if you will. 3 John. Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence. He's a classic example of a Pharisee, of a false prophet, of somebody that hates those that are around him, and he just uses people to get what he wants. Now, we get two good examples in this chapter. We touched on Gaius this morning. If we will look at verse number 1, it says, The elder, unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, beloved. I mean, three times he says, I love this guy. He says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Now, this morning we talked about soul health. Is your soul healthy and prosperous? We're going to be talking about the spirit and the flesh. We're going to be talking about all three elements of the human being over this next month. The theme for the month is healthy. And again, it's not just whether you had, you know, toast or pancakes for breakfast or whether you're going to Whataburger for dinner. There's a whole, there's a lot more to health than just that. It's not just what goes into the body that defiles a man. And Jesus is clear about that. And yet there are actually many medical miracles in the Bible of simple herbs that God gives us that if we would just do it, it would literally change our being or it would change our life and give us better health. Then it would give us better, better mental clarity and things. So we got to balance all of that out. But you know, Worse than a sick body is a sick spirit. Yeah. A sick spirit can make your body sick. I've seen people that look healthy, but boy, are they just upset and mad and they got a bad attitude. And I've seen people, and boy, they don't look so healthy. But they love people and they help people. And they encourage people. And you may look at them and say, I don't even see how they're still hanging on. I mean, they got this sickness and this thing and then some surgery. And boy, they look rough. But they're just smiling and loving on people and caring for people. And through that great affliction and sorrow that they have, they're showing the love of Christ to others. And that, I believe, is keeping them alive through that positive spirit. Uh, continue with you in, in 3 John. He says, uh, I love it. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. That man had soul prosperity because he was saved, but then he was doing what the Bible said. He was walking in the truth. And notice in verse 4, he says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Isn't that something? He's saying, hey, once you're saved and I hear you begin to walk in the truth and get closer to God, I get more excited about that than anything else. I mean, John really was super happy that he could say, not only did they get saved, but now they got the Bible in their heart and they're growing in their understanding of the Bible and they're doing what it says. And because of that, God is blessing them and giving them prosperity and health. He says in verse 5, Beloved, Thou dost faithfully whatsoever thou doest unto the brethren and to strangers. Now, what he's, he's about to tell us, he's talking about charity, but I just want to give you this in advance as you read this verse. The charity and love that you have, not only does he do it to the Christian brothers, he's helping strangers out too? What kind of guy is this? Verse 6, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a goodly sort, thou shalt do well. He's actually talking about a large monetary donation of some sort that somebody was moving to another area to preach the gospel, to evangelize, and he made their journey. He funded the journey through his charity. I love you so much. I've got some money. Let me pay for your hotel. Let me pay for your travel so you can go and preach the gospel and not worry about a thing. He says in verse 7, because that for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. They went out glorifying Jesus and they didn't have to show up at a city, another city, the Gentiles, the nations, and say, hey, can we get some money to help raise for our support? We're doing a little mission over here. They didn't have to do a thing. They just showed up and started preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching. And they didn't have to worry about a thing. The bills were paid. That's how God uses people through charity. Look what he says in verse 8. We therefore ought to receive such 
What's he saying? Such a person. Diotrephes is a problem in this church. He's writing and saying, but boy, this Gaius, this is the kind of guy you want to receive. These are the kind of people you want to let in the church. He's coming to help you receive him. Let him in. He's going to encourage you. But you know what happens? We have this competition thing. And I've seen it in many churches. And, and I understand. Uh, they often call the pulpit a sacred desk, if you will. Because it here represents the authority that we're here to give the word of God. And you don't just want to let anybody do that. Because they might do it wrong or deceive people. So I understand we should defend it. But at the same time, my argument in our church is we've got many men in this church that know the word of God and know how to preach. And I want to see them get behind the pulpit. So we do a men's preaching night every month. I would rather see men get up here and fumble through it. What do we say? As stammering lips, it said. We read that this morning. Through stammering lips and stuttering and just say what God said and say it with confidence and say it, thus saith the Lord, and this is what we ought to do. Because it's not about showmanship and all these great characteristics you can obtain in college. It's about what God said and the Holy Spirit working through you. Now, he says you need to receive such. Well, some people, oh, I don't let anybody preach in my pulpit. I understand that. I don't want a false prophet to come in. But I want to see all the men in this church get behind this pulpit and preach and tell people about Jesus. You don't have to be a scholar to do that. You just need to be saved. Here he says, this guy was doing such a great job. Verse 8, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but... Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, received us not. This guy stopped them and prevented it. And, oh, we don't want to hear from them. We don't like their camp. We don't, I don't know about that guy. Hey, we're in here doing our job. You stay out. And now this guy was already causing division in his church and wouldn't let a helper come in. He's like, receive them and be a fellow helper. We're working together. We carry this load together. It's the Lord's work that we're doing. It's not even just our own. We're not building our own kingdom. He said, we receiveth us not. Verse 10, look, he says, wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. Unfortunately, there are a lot of churches like that today. It's like, well, if they don't come from our camp, you know, they're, they're evil people, kick them out, that sort of thing. Listen, I thank God that we have unity in our church. And listen, I thank God we have men in the church that want to preach. And listen, when I'm not here and these men are preaching, support them. Encourage them. And if you feel the Lord calling you to preach, men, just get up and do it. We've provided the opportunity you don't have to have this thing memorized to be able to tell us what God has laid on your heart. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. I'd rather you get up and mispronounce every name in here than just tell us something great about Jesus. If you would go to Matthew 23, I just want to show you how this Diotrephes is a Pharisee type. Now the Pharisees, again, the, the leaven of the Pharisees was they preached a works salvation. They wanted to put this impossible burden on somebody. Could you imagine if I came to you and I said, hey, you might get to heaven if you stop all of your sin and give all of your money and all of your time and never have a bad thought. You start saying, oh man, this is getting impossible. They're like putting this big rock on your shoulder. If you can just carry this thing for the rest of your life, you might get out of here. You'd say, I give up. What's the point? Well, that's what they were doing to people because they were manipulating the law and teaching a false gospel. In Matthew 23, boy, Jesus let them have it. Jesus, who is kind and compassionate, you know what he did when a wolf came into the flock? Now, Jesus was a working man, wasn't he? I mean, he whipped him out of the temple when he began his ministry. Three years later, he whipped him out again. Brother Chad touched on it in Sunday school this morning. And he said he forbade them not even to carry a vessel. No, I'm selling this. You get out of here. I mean, Jesus had strength physically, but that's not what it was about. His strength was spiritual and in serving people. He wasn't a weakling. He didn't look like a hippie. He didn't wear a dress. He was a man's man. Amen. But when it came to the false prophets, these Pharisees, 
Jesus had no fear. And he went toe to toe with them. And he stood in his, their face and he told, he told them. He warned the people, listen sheep, look out. These are wolves. They're trying to eat you. They're lying to you about how to go to heaven. You be careful when you listen to them. Look, he, look in, in Matthew 23, look at verse 1. Then spake Jesus unto the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That much is true. They were there in the temple keeping the sacrifice and the ordinance and giving the law as they were supposed to. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe. Ob observe Moses' law, he's saying. That observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the border of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at the feast. Doesn't this sound familiar? Do you remember what we just read about Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence? Hey, that's my chair up there. I sit above the people. I wear the fancy robe. Look, you can come into church wearing whatever you want. I mean, as long as it's modest and decent. But, you know, you, don't have, you can wear a t-shirt and jeans or shorts and flip-flops. That's okay. I dress up because I want to bring my best to the house of the Lord. If you show up in, you know, flip-flops and shorts, I'm not going to run you out of here. God forbid I would reject your appearance and you lose an opportunity to be blessed by the Word of God or to worship God. God forbid we would have that attitude, right? But, you know, I mean, I, I wear a, a suit and a tie just because, hey, that's what I wore last time I got a job. I put on a suit and a tie, and I went in there, and I said, yes, sir, and I had respect. And boy, they're like, yes, sir, well, you're sharp. I want you to start. When can, how soon can you start? All right, I mean, if I'll do it for work, I should do it for the Lord's work. Amen. That's just how I feel personally. I mean, if I showed up and I didn't have a tie, it wouldn't be the end of the world. But they made it a thing where we have the holy garments, and we have the vestments, and we are the upper crust, Right? Verse 6, and love the uppermost rooms at the feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplace to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. You know, you don't have to call me Pastor Fannin. You don't. You can call me Brother Adam. You can, if you just slipped up and said, hey, Fannin, I'd be okay with that. I had a pastor, a great pastor years ago, and I called him by his first name, and he asked me, he said, Brother, just out of, do you mind helping me as I'm teaching the children to respect their elders? Would you, you don't have to call me pastor, but would you at least call me Brother Gary? And boy, it broke my heart. I said, no, you're, yes, sir, you're right, amen, I should. Right, doesn't it tell us at the end of the chapter we read earlier to greet them by name? We should salute those Sister Sylvia, she's not just any old Sylvia. Hey, there's 10 Sylvias in town, but there's only one sister Sylvia. And she's my sister forever in Christ. Right, these terms mean something. It's not just, you know, we're in a club. But here they're using them. Oh, hey, uh, I noticed you wrote me a letter and you didn't put Pastor Fannin on there. You need to correct that and call me by my title. I don't care about the title. I'm thankful to do the work. Because really the title is supposed to be minister, which means servant of all. You could come up and say, hey, slave. And I'd say, well, yes, sir, how can I help you? you know? I mean, I should, right? We shouldn't get all upset about what we are. We're all really just slaves, if you, if you haven't figured that one out yet. But anyway, look, so he says, don't be called master. Don't be called rabbi. He says, verse 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Tell that to the Catholics. <laughs> Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And there it is. He that is your leader is here to serve you. If you guys haven't figured it out yet in your family, your dad probably does the hardest work. 
And, you know, it is good to honor your father and respect him at dinner and maybe feed him first or, uh, hey, children, help dad first or something to show him respect because, frankly, he gets up early and he goes out and he worries about you and he's trying to make sure that you're going to get everything you need so that you can get off and have a great life. I mean, he's working double time to make sure that you have what you need. Of course we should respect our parents. Here it's the same way in the church. And listen, but he, sa he says, He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Hey, you want to be in church leadership? You think you want, you're, you're called to ministry? Then get ready to serve people. Get ready to love people because that's what we're called to do. Verse 12, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. This is the Diotrephes, Demetrius parallel. The one guy was just super low key. Very little said about him, but he was right and he was loving, and he was kind in the church and used of God. Diotrephes, loving the preeminence, loving the highest seat, wanting all the, all the flame and the name and the give me, give me whatever I can get. Here the Bible teaches, if you will humble yourself and serve others, that God will take care of you in a great way. You have a need in your life somewhere, humble yourself, serve others, and just watch what God will do. Just watch him do the work. Look, verse 13, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering. He, they're preventing people. They're closing the door. They're shutting the door. Of faith. Oh, it's not by faith. You have to do the work. You have to keep the law and get circumcised and keep the Sabbath. And where's your Passover? And by the way, do this plus that. And where's your heave offering? And I mean, they're like, oh man, I can't keep all this. I'm broke. Whereas God sees those that's humble and contrite in heart. 14, this is taken out of all the other Bibles. They delete this whole verse, by the way. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore shall ye receive the greater damnation. Why, why would the Catholic Bibles and everyone that follows after, the NASV, the NLT, the NIV, the ESV, the LSB, Legacy Standard Bible, the new one that MacArthur had, they all delete this. Why would they delete this? See, boy, there's 5,000. I mean, we have thousands of copies where they have this, but there's a few that say, well, that's not there. Why would they delete it? Because they're attacking widows, which God forbids. They're devouring widows' houses, and for a pretense, they're pretending when they pray. You know the story of the Pharisee, oh Lord, I'm not like others. Boy, I'm not like that worthless guy. They're pretending when they pray and they're just trying to make some big speech for everybody to hear because the works they do are to be seen of other people. They want to pat themselves on the back, but God sees their heart and says, I don't like you. I don't accept you. In fact, he says at the end of this verse in 14, he says, therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. Do you know that there is a hotter hell, if you will? There is a greater damnation. Now, he tells us in, in Hebrews that if we've served Christ, we have a better resurrection. So the more you do for him, the better you are in the resurrection. Those that hate him and turn others away from him, they have a greater damnation. They have a hotter hell. Yeah, amen, like Hitler. Look at verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, he will make twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. They make converts. They go out of their way to make one, and when they make one, this guy is so hardened against God and the truth, he'll never hear the truth about Jesus. Uh, finally, let's finish this. Look at verse 23. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin. Do you know what he's saying there? Can you, ima can you imagine? I tithe of everything that I have. I got a little bit of an herb. And let's, let's put, the, there you go, 10%. I, you see that? I gave everything. I'm giving all, you know. I mean, that's what they're doing. Look at me. Ring the bell. I'm giving something, you know. They have literally every herb off every plant just to show off for people. Hypocrites, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted, this is strong, he says, have omitted the weightier matters of the law. The most heavy thing, the most important thing in the whole Bible is this, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. 
judgment, mercy, and faith. God is our righteous judge. There is a judgment coming for every one of us. Every one of us must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. We know what's coming in the future. So let's get busy. Let's just do what he wants us to do and get on board and get on the plan and get on track and run that race. And we know what the finish line looks like. So let's do it. But then he says, and mercy. The Pharisees failed at having mercy on others. And that's where as Christians, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to be very merciful to other people, especially in the church. And here's the greatest thing that they missed in verse 20, 23, judgment, mercy, and faith. They didn't believe in Jesus. They failed. That was the number one thing. Just believe. They couldn't even do that. Their heart was so hard and they were so proud of themselves, they would not believe on Jesus. And in a sense, they sort of sealed their fate because they were so hard-hearted. Look at verse 33. Ye serpents. Boy, he calls them snakes. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Do you know what that means? You know what a generation is? That's a son of or a child of. What's a viper? A snake. Who's the snake? That old serpent, the devil. He says, you're children of the devil. He knew what he was saying. He's calling them children of the devil to their face in the temple as people were watching. You're a bunch of children of the devil, what you're doing. Look what he says. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And then he seals their fate. He says, you cannot escape the destiny of hell that you have. And here's what blows my mind. This is amazing. Jesus died for their sin, didn't he? And yet they hated him and rejected him. But they died in unbelief. Because they would not believe in his payment for their sin, even after they saw the miracles, even after they saw the resurrection, they still hated him and they still didn't believe. And he knew that they wouldn't believe. And that's why he said, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Not only do you have a hotter hell, a greater damnation, You've sealed your fate. You've seared your conscience. And now you're a son of the devil. You can never be a son of God because you hate God and his son. And now you're on your way to hell already. And while you're here, you're trying to take as many people with you as you can and make them a child of hell. That's the false prophets of the world. The Pharisees today are found in many religious organizations and groups. It's those that are real heady and high-minded, and they're all about having the college degree, and frankly, a lot of Calvinists would fall in this category. Judaism today, there are many different branches of Judaism, but very specifically, rabbinical Judaism claims to be the Pharisees of Jesus' time. That's their own claim. They say, yeah, we're the ones that put Jesus to death. We're rabbinical Judaism. We read out of the Babylonian Talmud. Now listen, th that's a wicked religion. Some of them have this same heart. Some can be saved. I mean, some of the Pharisees were saved. If you will, look at verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. It all goes back to their heart. They sealed their fate. They would not believe on Jesus. That Demetrius, or I'm sorry, Diotrephes that was fighting against Demetrius and would not let Gaius into the church. It, what a picture of a church that was struggling and help was on the way and he was pushing them out and pushing believers out. And it's a classic case of he was a Pharisee. I've got the college degree and I decide what's going on. Listen, the church is the people, the congregation. And I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that's in every one of you. And together we work together and we serve each other as we serve Christ for what time we have here. In John 13, 35, he says, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. I quote that verse often, not because I think you need to work on it, but because I think I need to work on it. I think we need to work on it. 
And the definition, the illustration I give with it is, how will people know about Christ? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Those people out there, look at us in here, how we treat each other in here, and it determines how close we are to him up there. That's their whole opinion. Why would I want to go to a church like that? All they do is talk bad about each other and try to hurt each other. I'm, I'm sure I've got enough of that in my life. I've got that at work. I don't want it on Sunday. <laughs> right? God forbid. I do thank God for just the pleasant spirit and the unity in our church. The liberty and the freedom to be a little bit different in certain nuances of our doctrine, but we stand as one on the foundation of Christ and the Godhead and the Bible and salvation and the things that matter the most and, and love. And I thank God for the love in our church. I love you for loving Him. And let's love some other folks and invite them in. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. I just ask that you would help us to understand these verses, that it might change us and help us to see how we can get closer to you. Lord, I do pray that you would continue to use this church as an opportunity to reach others and to reach the lost. Lord, I pray that you would raise up a generation of children out of here that would be preachers for you, that would see many souls saved. I humbly ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.